Ben, eh, eh, Dibu Martínez, eh, 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 stop the ball eh, at, the, at the final final of the game. And, you know, <laughs> we, eh, the Argentinians, we are still not believing that and we feel that the ball is going to pass to the goal. <laughs> So <laughs> we still think of that. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. It's so awesome. how you how you been, guys? <clears throat> Someone has a schedule. Oh, good. Yeah, everything's been good. So Great. I think that um, you know, I think we're all feeling uh, fortunate to be doing what we love to do and sharing what we love to share. And um, uh, you know, it's. Uh, It's great to do it with uh, some of the best people in the world who do it. So, you know, mm -hmm. so I love that. And I'm really grateful to be part and, of course, participate with you oh, guys. Oh, yeah, you're a big part of it. So, good to <laughs> oh, have you. Ni nice background, Terry. Uh, you you're mute. You're mute. <laughs> no, I, I, we can hear you. You are muted. I'm just sitting here watching this video, mesmerized by all the motion in the video. Oh yeah, that's really cool, Scott. I like that. Yeah, these visualizations from NASA are just incredible. And I'm just listening to all this, and it's so cool to be part of this group. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Ron. It's a pleasure to have you on, Ron. So that's great. That's great. So yeah, so we're we're going to get started now, and. Uh, Uh, so welcome uh, to our audience. Uh, David Eicher is uh, chimed in here. He says he's in rainy Atlanta. Um, <laughs> swimming Tigris music. Hello from Winnipeg. Mike Wiesner from Arizona. Norm Hughes uh, out here nearby. So howdy, Scott and crew. Here we go. And my daughter, Jessica. Hi, Dad. <laughs> It's awesome. Here we go. <laughs> Roughly every year or two, somewhere in the world, the sun appears for a few moments as a ring of fire in the sky. This is called an annular solar eclipse. Annular comes from the Latin word annulus, which means ring. An annular solar eclipse occurs when a new moon passes directly in front of the sun but appears too small to cover it completely. But why is that? It's because the moon's orbit around Earth isn't a perfect circle, but rather an ellipse, or slightly oval shaped. This causes the moon to move closer to us and then farther away during its month-long orbit. When the moon is at its closest point, called perigee, it appears slightly larger in our sky. When it's farthest from us, at apogee, it appears a little smaller. But we don't see an annular eclipse every month. That's because the moon's orbit is also slightly tilted in relation to Earth's orbit around the sun. This means during most months, the moon is either too high or too low to block the sun. So only when a new moon is at apogee and passes directly between Earth and the sun, do spectators on Earth get the rare opportunity to see the ring of fire in the sky. Unlike a total solar eclipse, when the moon completely covers the sun, during an annular eclipse, the sun never fully disappears. So if you're lucky enough to be in the path of an annular solar eclipse, make sure to wear your solar eclipse glasses or use other safe solar filters to witness the spectacular ring of fire in the sky. Hello everyone, Scott Roberts here from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. Uh, we're proud to host the 121st Global Star Party called Unfolding uh, Cosmos. Uh, I'll start with a uh, quote from Seth Shostak. Seth Shostak, Dr. Seth Shostak from SETI will actually be on our program tonight giving a talk on um, you know, the short history of looking for aliens. Um, as compelling as that, might sound, uh, you know, it is serious business. Um, 
this quote uh, goes, it's hard to imagine anything more interesting than learning that how we're woven into the enormous tapestry of existence. Where did our universe come from? And how special is our world? And how special are we? We allocate tens of billions of dollars annually to, to NASA, NSF, and academia in search of the answers. And uh, so hopefully you're uh, gonna stay with us tonight and take this ride. Uh, we have uh, the Unfolding uh, Cosmos edition has some amazing speakers, including Seth Shostak, but we kick off almost every global star party. In fact, every global star party with David Levy, comet discoverer and astronomer renowned uh, with his uh, words of inspiration and poetry. Then we switch to Terry Mann. Terry is a two time uh, former president of the Astronomical League and she is currently the secretary of the Astronomical League. And she'll be talking about uh, uh, the unfolding universe <laughs> of, of the league itself. And so um, then we have Seth Shostak with uh, his short history of the search for aliens. Ron Breacher, who has uh, never appeared on our program before, it's, it'll be his first time, uh, is an incredible astrophotographer. I think he is an ambassador for Pix Insight, and so he'll be giving his presentation for the first time here on the 121st Global Star Party. Uh, we end our first section with uh, Molly Wakeling uh, and her Astronomy series, and she's going to be talking about the supernova uh that uh is everyone is watching in galaxy m101 and so uh, it's a type 2 supernova and uh, she's going to talk about what makes a type 2 supernova and why supernova is so special uh we'll take a break and then we come back with maxi flores uh from argentina john schwartz and uh hopefully several others so uh thanks for tuning in tonight and um uh, we'll take it away. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the 121st Global Star Party. When I, I, was, I was typing out the numbers on the announcement posters that I make up for this uh, program, and I was just thinking back to when we first started doing Global Star Party and uh, uh, all the amazing people that have appeared on it, all the amazing audience members. Some of the audience members actually joined us on Global Star Party, which was you know, fantastic. Um, but uh, there's been some amazing moments. Uh, I'm reminded of the time when David Levy and I, and I think it was Steve Malia, we did, I think it was a marathon, almost 24 hour uh, global star party um, at one point. Um, uh, I'm reminded also of, um, you know, uh, the, the very first one that we ever did where I literally, I was still experimenting on learning how to do broadcasting and I apologize to all of you that had to suffer through those first few broadcasts, but uh, uh, it was a lot of fun and we learned a lot. Um, in the process, we got to teach some other people that wanted to learn how to do broadcasting for astronomy clubs and their meetings and that type of thing. And that got us through COVID. Um, it, another fortunate aspect was our involvement with the Astronomical League. and. Um, being able to program uh, all of their astronomical league, lo league live programs. Um, I just rewatched part of the broadcast that we did from last year's Alcon, which was uh, which was a real privilege to do. And so it, it has been a great privilege to do Global Star Parties, and I look forward to doing it, each and every one of them. So uh, we have, I, I talked to uh, some of the, uh, 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 or mention some of the people that are in chat right now. We got Huachaca Astronomy Club it says, hi all from Southeastern Arizona, where it's very warm. Uh, Ron Breacher is in the chat as well. Norm Hughes, uh, welcoming everybody. So anyhow, um, 
no matter where you're watching, uh, we hope you enjoy this program. Uh, we know that some of you combine actual real observing and listening to Global Star Party at the same time, which I think is fun and cool. Um, and we love your comments and questions. So uh, up next is uh, uh, David Levy. Uh, David and I were talking uh, kind of backstage a little bit about uh, uh, how fortunate we are uh, to be able to participate in astronomy in the way that we can. And, uh, you know, I was marveling at David's life in particular and all the amazing experiences that he's had. Um, you know, he's had his challenges, of course, but, uh, uh, you know, the shining, uh, the brilliant uh, moments in his life uh, in meeting some of the most uh, luminary people in, um, in astronomy, uh, I, you know, I think it's uh, something that um, when you got to sit back and look at it, you just almost lose your breath. You know, it's it's uh, it's very cool. He got to know them. He wrote about them. He became friends with them, and um, and he participated in the search for comets and asteroids and stuff like that with them. Uh, some of them as well. So. I'm going to bring on David. Thank you very much for coming on to the 121st. It sounds like a 2001 number, doesn't it? 121 yeah. somehow, but uh, yeah, uh, which is another as a movie that David and I love, which is 2001: A Space Odyssey. But I'll turn it over to you, David. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Scott, and uh, Thank you. welcome to the 121st Global Star Party, unfolding cosmos. You're not going to hear about this on the nightly news. Can you just see, good evening, welcome to the CBS Evening News, and the Cosmos is doing this or that. You'll never hear that on the nightly news, and especially not in the local news. You'll hear that there was a fire in Douglas, Arizona, at two churches. That was the big news, we're all going, oh my, terrible, which we are. And uh, the daily, almost daily mass shooting that we hear and uh, everything else. But one thing we will never hear about, and we might even hear about a comet from time to time, or certainly an eclipse from time to time, but nothing about the unfolding cosmos. That's different. That requires us to change our thought. It requires us to stop thinking about the daily news because the cosmos doesn't care about the daily news. The cosmos runs in time scales that are way, way beyond what you and I are familiar with. Our entire lives, from birth to marriages, maybe to death, is less than a nanosecond of cosmic time. It's it's completely different. So, in the course of our life, the night sky is going to look approximately the same the day we're born as it does the day we are about to die. And um, which brings me a little bit to a little bit of personal business that I'd like to share with you. As you, some of you know, I have been prone to depression my whole life. My first one was when I was a patient at the uh, Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children in Denver. And uh, after I was there for about a year, I guess something inside me just said, I want to go home. And I got extremely depressed. And uh, I eventually did get, hi Molly, I eventually did get, uh, get to be sent home. And then after I did very well at Acadia, and I got my bachelor's degree there, and then went into an extremely bad depression, that I almost didn't come out of because there was a big suicide attempt the following spring. And then I gradually, gradually pulled out of these things and I had my life, I had my comets, but more than anything else, I had Wendy. I am now going through a massive depression, but this one's different from the others. This one I have a reason for. This one, there is a cause. The cause is that I've lost Wendy. I miss her very, very much. I went to the um, 
I went to the cemetery two days ago, sort of talked with her, told her what I was up to or not up to, and uh, I thought it was a pretty good visit. And I go there very often. And uh, we're also designing the uh, tombstone that will be placed probably early this fall and uh, doing all kinds of things like that. But life is going on, whether it's our little toy lives that are talked about on the nightly news for some of us, or the life of cosmic, of the unfolding cosmos. So we get to our poem tonight. This one's by Tennyson. And when, when, I write, when I quote from Shakespeare or Tennyson, these are two poets that I admire intensely. And I have a little habit that I've gotten into. When I get to a poet that I really like, and that's just about all of them, I try to find out if there are any living descendants. It was easy with Shakespeare, there aren't any. But with Tennyson, I found about about Jonathan Tennyson, his great grandson. And uh, that was a very interesting story because I, <clears throat> I kind of realized that this, that this uh, situation that wasn't all that long ago, Tennyson was writing in the mid 19th century and he had a child, he had a couple of children and uh, they got married and had children of their own. And then those children had children of their own. And then one of them was Jonathan Tennyson. So I decided to write to him, told him what I was up to. Would you believe I got an answer within 10 minutes? He said, yeah, David, I know who you are. I've written a lot of papers on Shoemaker Levy 9. I am an astronomer. And the next time you come to London, you got to see me. I got to see you. And it turned out I had a trip to London planned. So I got to meet him just a few weeks later. And it was really, really something I will never forget. We're talking like two old friends. And then I'm thinking, your great grandfather was Alfred Lord Tennyson, which brings us to the poem. And when we go up tonight, a little bit about even Venus is not cosmic time, but for the last month or so, it has been very, very high in the Western sky. In ancient times, when Venus was high in the West at dusk, it was called Hesper. And when it comes in the morning sky, it was called Phosphor. And I kind of like that. I'm quoting tonight from Tennyson's most famous poem, In Memoriam. And you know, the famous in memoriam stanza, which is uh, A-B-B-A, which is really my favorite rhyme scheme. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, he talks about sunspots. And was the day of my delight as pure and perfect as I say, the very source and fount of day is dashed with wandering isles of night. That is not a scientific description of a sunspot but it's damn beautiful. At night, no ruder air perplex by sliding keel till phosphor, bright as our pure love, through early light shall glimmer on the dewy decks. Bright phosphor, fresher for the night, by thee the world's great work is heard, beginning on the wakeful bird, behind becomes the greater light. Sweet Hesper, sweet Hesper Foster, double name. For what is one, the first, the last, thou like my present and my past, thy place, thy place is changed, thou art the same. Thank you. Bye, teacher. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, we are uh, pleased to uh, bring on next um, Terry Mann from the Astronomical League. Uh, let me bring her on right now. And Terry's got this beautiful shot behind her. Okay, this is, uh, uh, you can see the, uh, the statues, those famous statues from Easter Island. Um, and all the people that were, uh, you know, behind the curtain, so to speak, here at uh, Global Star Party, they're asking her, 
about this particular image because it's so stunning. Um, uh, but uh, Terry took this image uh, from a recent trip to Easter Island. Um, so thanks for coming on, uh, Terry, and for doing this. I know you've been crazy busy, uh, but it's so nice to have you here. Well, thank you, Scott. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, that's probably, I hadn't been in the Southern Hemisphere in a long time. It's still as beautiful as what it was the last time I saw it. So, you know, tonight I thought about um, your topic. And for me, when I stop and think about this, I, I think it is incredible because there is so much that goes on in the cosmos and it's so amazing to learn about it. Um, I think a lot of what draws me to astronomy is the fact that it's always changing. There's always something new, something exciting to see. And it keeps my mind busy and it keeps me wanting to do things and work on stuff. So I decided to take this from the angle of what does the unfolding cosmos mean to me? Because I can soak everything in, but how will I use this information? So one of the things I came up with was if there is something like an eclipse or a meteor shower in Ohio, it isn't going to matter if I'm awake or if I'm asleep, because if it's something exciting in Ohio, I'm not going to see it unless it's a full moon. And this is something in Ohio you kind of get used to. You never like it, but you get used to it. You go to bed and you're not happy and you'll wake up every couple hours and it's still cloudy. But let's say I went to Utah. Utah, you're not going to find me sleeping until after the sun rises because there are incredible skies out west compared to where I'm at. So the first thing for me, it depends on where I'm at, what it means to me. But the one thing I do know is whether I'm going somewhere, because most of the time I have to go somewhere to do some imaging, um, I have to, the first thing I think about is, okay, am I flying? Uh, what can I take on a plane? Are they going to stop me in customs because I got a meteorite in my pocket? You know, what's going to happen here? Can I drive and take the kitchen and the kitchen sink with me? That way I have everything I ever wanted. So it depends on where I'm at and what I'm shooting. You know, I'm looking at what camera do I use? What telescope? Should I use a star tracker? So many things keep me thinking. And that's what I like. There's a challenge to this. People can say you go out, you take a picture, and there you go. That's your astrophotography. Nothing hard about that. And sometimes if that's all you want, it's just a simple little picture, then it's great. But astrophotography takes a dedication because you become a problem solver, or at least that's what I think we are. We, have, we can turn, on, turn our equipment off one night and it's working perfect. And the very next time you turn it on, nothing will talk to anything. And you're like, what has happened? I don't know. So uh, we become problem solvers. And not only that, yeah, we can get all the pictures now. How do we make it into something that really looks pretty? You have learned the first step. Now go to the second step, processing. Um, there is a lot to it, but it is a great challenge. And if you like that, then, you know, whether you're visual and sketching or imaging and using camera equipment, it really gives you a lot to do. And so I've always liked it. So let's look at one of the things that is unfolding. Solar cycle 25. Now, solar cycle 24 was really kind of weak. And they said 25 would basically be the same. Well, it's not. <laughs> We're getting a lot more sunspots, a lot more activity. And I am an aurora chaser, I, but I'll admit I go to Alaska because chasing again down here sometimes can be hard. But I believe with cycle 25, we will probably get more aurora in the lower 48. But Terry's crystal ball has been wrong before. But I really do believe we'll probably see this down farther um, in the States. This is one of my pictures. If you've not been to Alaska, or maybe you have, or someplace where you've seen this, a lot of times at night, it will start with a quiet arc. You will see the aurora arc over as it comes, uh, you know, as it gets more active. And I think this is a panel of about seven images of the quiet arc over the North Pole in Alaska. And it is so amazing to watch it just move. It is an incredible thing to see. 
And part of the reason I'm telling you this is if you've ever thought you wanted to go to Alaska to see the aurora, the next two years, honestly, are it. It would be fantastic time because I have seen more purples, reds, blues than I've ever seen there in my life. And granted, I'm only there, you know, for a couple, three weeks um, because most of the time what you see is this green. And this is a beautiful sunset. The aurora was started oh, up nice. as a sunset. Spectacular. Well, thank you. Even though there were clouds, it, it was spectacular to watch that. The clouds added more character, I thought. But to watch this start to actually get active was amazing. And the structure, the motion of the aurora when it's really active, the reds and the blues, and you really see that when it's not at a solar max. You can still see some of that at sunrise before the sun rises and right after sunset. But what I was seeing uh, last year was just the color was everywhere all the time. There was aurora every night, but you can see the reds, but the structure that you see, the rays, the curves, everything, the motion was so incredible. So seriously, if you were thinking about going to Alaska, you got a couple of years plan on it. You won't be disappointed. But then, you know, what happens is you do all this stuff and you start to watch everything. And all of a sudden, you're kicked back, you're watching the sky, and everything comes together. The sky starts to dance, wow. the colors come out, the structure, all of the motion. By the time it did this, I am laying flat on my back in the snow with my usual, oh, wow, look at this. Holy this snow. is real time. Uh, shot with the Sony A7S. It was just incredible. And this is the kind of stuff, the coronal aurora that you see overhead, that you see a lot in Alaska. It is truly amazing. You will not forget it. It will just kind of blow your socks off. But when it all comes together like that, you sit there and think, okay, this is the moment. This is what I was waiting for. This is just a connection that, you know, we all have, I think, with the stars for all of us that are really interested in this. So another thing, as Molly is going to talk about, uh, is the supernova. This is Barbara Harris down in Florida. The JBAR Observatory shot this. This supernova is incredible. And it is so amazing because you look at all the amateurs, all or even the professional or the semi-professional, whatever. The amateurs can add so much to the science. I mean, they are out there with the equipment that does amazing work and they know how to use that equipment right. You look at a lot, of everybody on this program that is an imager, everybody does amazing work and they can do it in the wink of an eye if they have dark, clear skies. So it's amazing what can happen. And I'll be interested to hear what Molly's got to say here. And we've got an annular eclipse that will be coming up out west on October 14th. But here, I believe we've got partial eclipses all around the uh, US, I believe. So it's a good way to kind of practice for the total eclipse that's coming. But this is another connection to the sky, a ring of fire. I saw this one ew, back in the 90s, I believe it was. Um, and I had never seen a ring of fire and I was so excited <laughs> just to see something like this in the sky. And then we've got the April 8th for the total solar eclipse. Now, I am amazed how many people are still unaware of this. Um, totally unamazed because our next one in the US won't be till August 23rd, 2044. And you know, this is one of those that people like me might not be around in 2044. Or if I am, who knows if I'm gonna feel like being at one. So this is kind of our last major total solar eclipse in the U.S. for a long time. And I think that will probably drive a lot of people that have never seen a total solar eclipse out to see it because the center line also is going over so much of the U.S. So this is another connection that we've got. Um, I've seen a couple. I was in Casper and in Casper, I was trying to explain. I did a couple workshops that the corona is different for every eclipse. And what really amazed me was NASA had put out um, about two days before what the corona would probably look like. I didn't know they did that. 
And so I was doing a workshop at a library and I said, now this is what NASA is saying the Corona is probably going to look like. And you know, it was exactly like it was going to look like. It was incredible to see that. But I was trying to say, this is like the Aurora. Yeah, you see it at once, but the structure, this is, everything about it will be different every time you see it. Now, the one thing that I really found amazing, I have had the emergency services in countywide here contact me to work with them about what an eclipse is, what to expect, because so much had happened on the 2017. So I find myself now working with two states in emergency services. Everybody out there that has knowledge of the eclipse might be a good idea if you guys contact emergency services or libraries or the school. I am speaking at libraries uh, a lot, <laughs> just everywhere in a lot of different areas. Um, and maybe all of you can help too because people don't know this and it's going right over our houses and they don't know about this. But the one thing I really want you to stress as always is the safety of watching a solar eclipse. Um, as I've said before, uh, we always want everybody to view it safely. And all the glasses, which I have got, the plastic pair, which I'm surprised, these are all marked with conforms to and meets transmission requirements of ISO 12312-2, filters for direct observation of the sun. Please make sure all of your glasses, anything, your glasses that you're going to use direct viewing of the sun are marked with that and safe. Stress that everywhere. And you know, if you do that, you guys can help unfold the cosmos for others that have not looked up and have not seen it. So please reach out wherever you can to help educate everybody on viewing this safely. And I will close with, on AL Live, as Scott brought up earlier, June 9th at 7 p.m., Adam Block, he will be talking about pics in sight uh, uh, right here. So, and also Alcon, we have our Astronomical League Conference in Baton Rouge, July 26th through July 29th. Please join us. We will have David Levy there. Yes, David will be there in person. So please join us and many, many others. Fred Espinak, and I can't, go down the whole list. They have got excellent speakers and a tour to LIGO. So check that out on our website. And Scott, I will turn that over to you. Okay, that was excellent. So we got a whirlwind experience through, uh, through our solar system. And um, uh, there's lots of stuff to do. And, uh, yep. you know, so we're, we're all going to be busy, busy astronomers. And we've got yeah, as as Terry said, we got a, a, a big word to get out uh, so that people can experience a total eclipse of the sun or an annual annular eclipse of the sun uh, the, the right way uh, and uh, to have something to witness something that's really going to change a lot of people's lives. So um, thanks very much, Terry. And sure. uh, uh, we will talk more about the league uh, next week. So OK, thanks, Scott. Okay, take care. All right. So uh, my next speaker is Dr. Seth Shostak. He is a friend of, uh, of mine and also of many people that are in the astronomical community, but beyond the astronomical community. Seth has been searching for decades now for uh, extraterrestrial life um, uh, in, a, in a scientific way with the uh, uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, the SETI program uh, that was started by Frank Drake and I think Carl Sagan and perhaps a few others. Uh, but uh, uh, um, Seth is the senior astronomer. Uh, he uh, claims to have uh, gotten interested in extraterrestrial life at a young age of like 10 years old. Um, and uh, he went off to become a radio astronomer. Uh, he's worked with the greats, and he is uh, he's with us tonight uh, to talk more about, um, I guess, a short history of uh, the search for aliens. Thank you, Scott. Should I should I do this now? And should I do it in English? <laughs> I mean, you offered yes. four other 
alternatives. I was going to do it in Bosnia Herzegovina and dialect. <laughs> there you Man. go. And you're just coming back now from a trip uh, in Europe, is that correct? Yeah, I got back from Switzerland. Uh, I guess it was the day before yesterday. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm jet lagged, but uh, you know all that Swiss chocolate. Not to mention the cheese and the inhabitants of uh, Basel. Uh, you know they they provided momentary enlightenment. All yes. right, listen, I got to talk a little bit about the because this was the the uh, brief that uh, Scott gave me to talk a little bit about the history of searching for aliens. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not an historian. So frankly, this I know from nothing. But uh, I'm going to regale you with, you know, some things that you'll probably sit there and think, well, to begin with, this isn't true. And secondly, uh, secondly, it isn't even interesting. But on the other hand, for those of you who, you know, want to learn Polish in your spare time, this might be a good, a good time to start. Uh, as, as far as searching for aliens, you know, the idea of aliens, of course, is quite old. Uh, the, the Chinese were writing about it thousands of years ago. And the classical Greeks, actually, they believed that everything they could see in the sky was probably inhabited by aliens. And they didn't know that a lot of what they saw in the sky were, you know, the giant uh, stars, super giant stars, which probably don't have too many aliens on their surfaces. But, you know, the Greeks at least should be given credit for being optimistic. Uh, mm -hmm. But while they were happy to philosophize, and that's, after all, a Greek word, the Greeks were famous for never doing any ex experiments. They somehow didn't uh, seem to be interested in the experiment. But that changed by the 16th century, the invention of the telescope. You, you people know about that more than many. And uh, what the, the first thing that the telescope did was show that the planets, which had already uh, you know, developed a following because they moved around the sky, that the planets were actually not points of light, but spheres, that they were balls. And that surely was an incredible uh, discovery when it, whenever it was first made. We don't have any information about who first noticed that the, uh, the planets, in addition to moving around the sky in ways that the stars didn't, uh, actually looked spherical. Well, uh, this led, as telescopes got better, to the uh, endless fascination with Mars. Uh, Mars is every, everyone's favorite inhabited planet. Uh, there are Martians everywhere in books, movies, radio plays. The one place there may not be any Martians could be Mars, but nonetheless, we haven't given up on that yet. Uh, it's, it's the only world that allowed its surface to be seen with a relatively small telescope. You could actually see the ground on Mars, right? If you look at Venus, you're just looking at, at the weather. If you're looking at Jupiter or Saturn or Uranus or Neptune, you're looking at the weather. If you're looking at Mercury, maybe you see something, but probably you don't, not with a small telescope. So Mars was exceptional. And uh, it also bore several similarities to Earth. I mean, it wasn't just the fact that you could see something. It had a 23-degree axial tilt, so it had seasons. The, the Mars year, of course, is twice as long as our year here. So the seasons were a little bit slower in coming. But on the other hand, it had, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, all that. It had... It had those things. It also had a 24-hour day. It's just coincidence, but it did. And it also changed its albedo, its reflectivity, changed over the course of the Martian year, right? You know, things would get darker, then they get lighter, and they get darker, and they get lighter. And an interpretation of this for a long time was simply that what you were looking at was the vegetation on Mars. And, uh, you know, as the seasons changed, so did the vegetation. So everybody expected there were going to be Martians. Um, and these were actually at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, these expectations were supported largely by the work of Percival Lowell. Now, I don't know how many of you were ever Facebook friends with Percy Lowell, but Lowell was a smart guy. I, you know, his brother was president of Harvard and Lowell, Percival Lowell himself, uh, was said to be the smartest student that Harvard ever had. Now, mind you, it was only Harvard, so maybe that doesn't count for much. But still, uh, Percival Lowell was, you know, a guy to, to reckon with. And he had an eight-inch refractor. He looked at uh, Mars, and he saw the famous canals. Now, these canals kind of, you know, crisscrossed the surface of Mars. And he, he wrote several books about Mars. Uh, you, can, you can find them, even original editions, you can find them on eBay. But uh, he had an explanation for the canals, which was kind of nifty. He said, look, Mars is a dying, drying planet. It's, you know, 
uh, the water, the surface water was evaporating on Mars. And so the Martians had to build these canals, not only for commerce, but simply to bring water from the polar caps down to the, you know, the, the suburbs of their cities so people could bathe. Now, as I say, this was a popular idea. And Percival Lowell went to his grave in 1916, I believe he died, and he still believed all this. But by then, there weren't too many astronomers who did believe it, but he did. Okay, one thing you can do yourselves is work out, well, how big would those canals have had to be in order for, you know, Percy to see them with this eight inch telescope? And it turns out that, you know, even with the best of seeing, they would have to be 30 or 40 miles wide, these canals. Those are big canals. Maybe there was a lot of barge traffic on Mars. It's a, it's a little bit, you know, hard to believe you have a 30 mile wide canal. I mean, and, and I often wonder why he didn't look for railroads. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, canals are great, but they're slow. And uh, but railroads actually are even harder to see than canals. So um, now one thing that's worth mentioning is that other astronomers were persuaded by Lowell to look for the canals themselves, right? I mean, there was a lot of publicity attending this idea, and they could not find the canals. And Percy <laughs> would say, well, you know, the, the problem is that their telescopes are not in Arizona, right? Uh -huh. And he wasn't referring to the Tex-Mex cuisine particularly, but simply that the scene in Arizona was better than wherever these other people were. So uh, that, that was the deal there. Um, and actually, this was so controversial, even in its day, that some students set up a, an analog to Mars. They took a, a beach ball or whatever. They took a, a sphere, right? And then they drew some canals on it with the equivalent of a magic marker or whatever. And they put the sphere, you know, down the road a piece at a distance so that Percival Lowell, looking at that sphere, would see the same angular size as he would have seen Mars through his eight-inch telescope. And they simply asked him to map the canals of that that ball over there, right? And he did. He did. The only difficulty was that, you know, what he drew had no resemblance to what was actually on the ball. So, you know, he, he kind of dismissed that as I, I forget what excuse he used to explain that. But in any case, um, all right. What actually caused Percival Lowell to see the canals of Mars, except for the fact that he saw a new book contract in it? I don't think that was really it. It's not clear why he saw them. Many people have suggested it was an artifact of human vision and this, that, and the other. And in fact, uh, an experiment was done in some schools in the UK years ago where they would take uh, drawings that they had made of a circle, so that's a planet, and they just put blobs, dark blobs, uh, randomly across the circle. And they asked these students, the high school students, you know, map what you see from the back of the class. And they mapped Mars, and what they found was that up close, if they were a student in the first couple of rows, you know, they would sort of get a fairly accurate picture of what the, uh, the teacher had put in the front of the class. But if they were farther back, they began to connect the dots uh, in the literal sense that they would connect the blobs with straight lines. So it seems that, you know, making canals is something that has more to do with your brain and your eyes than it does with the waterworks on the red planet. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, this is a very durable idea. You know, when Mariner 4 uh, plopped down onto the rusty, dusty surface of Mars for the first time, the photos were shown by the JPL folks to the president, Lyndon Johnson, of the time. And Lyndon Johnson apparently said to the NASA guys, so where are the canals? And that's simply a tribute to American science education. Okay, uh, so we get into the space age. And uh, of course, Mariner 4 was the beginning of that when it comes to reconnaissance of Mars. Uh, Johnson may have been disappointed, but there were, you know, there were other people were rather excited to see that Mars looked, you know, kind of like the moon in, in many respects, because it had all these craters. I, I don't remember ever reading anything about the possibility of craters on the moon until they were seen with Mariner 4, uh, although we should have, we should have uh, expected it. Um, and so, you know, by the time of the space missions that actually were going to land on Mars, no one really expected too much. I mean, they knew that the moon was dead 
up until then, the moon had been alive. When I was a kid, uh, there was a popular comic strip, Dick Tracy, and he was always talking to people who lived on the moon. But then again, the guy who drew that comic strip had other problems. So, but, but Mars, Mars was still going, going to show us something interesting, uh, some sort of life. And yet, if you look at those first photos made by the Viking landers, right? They plop down onto the surface of Mars. Somebody pushes a button somewhere in Pasadena and the shutter opens on the cameras. And what is it going to show? Well, you know, some people figured it was going to show a little green guy looking at the camera at the other end and maybe waving to the earthlings. But what you actually saw was a, a landscape that looked like, you know, Arizona. <laughs> it, it was, a, it was a, a little disappointing. And there wasn't even any vegetation. Everybody, even Carl Sagan expected there would be some plants or maybe some fungi or something like that. But there was nothing. It was a parched frigid desert and even more significantly nothing changed right you could <laughs> what, what is the joke you know if you're not the lead dog not, the view never changes well in fact nothing was changing on mars right it was the same you can make the photos day after day after day and they always look the same and that suggested that mars wasn't a terribly interesting place um Norm Horowitz, who was one of the NASA guys connected with this whole program, was reacting to the disappointment of many people when he made this famous quote about these images saying that, well, it could be that there is life on Mars that looks like rocks. On the other hand, what look like rocks in these photos could be rocks. Okay. Well, all right. At this point, of course, SETI had come on the scene and uh, that began in 1960. So uh, interest in life in space kind of shifted away from Mars which wasn't showing too much to be optimistic about towards SETI. Um, and when we did a lot of, of, of that, actually in the early days, we, you know, I and a couple of dozen other astronomers, radio astronomers who had access to radio telescopes, when we had a, a period of time when there weren't too many objects that we were interested in in the sky, you know, people would look up the positions, the coordinates of nearby sun-like stars, and point the antennas in those directions, hoping to eavesdrop on some signal from the aliens. That would have been great had it happened, but it didn't happen. So uh, that's sort of the end of the uh, prelude to what we do now. The big difference occurred in the 1970s when a medical doctor from the UK, John Billingham, who was working across the street here at NASA Ames Research Center, went to a lecture in which people were talking about the possibility of finding ET doing so by eavesdropping on radio broadcasts. And he started something called the NASA SETI program. And the descendant of that are the SETI programs, including the one here at the SETI Institute that we, that we do today. So I think that that's you know, more than you ever really wanted to know about this tedious history of how we've been looking for life in space. Uh, just don't expect too much from Mars, except those rocks that look like rocks. <laughs> Seth, that was fantastic. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to part two and three of, of this history. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be, but okay. <laughs> but anyhow, um, uh, I, we talked a little bit in chat with uh, the audience here about seeing that effect, that web effect or the lines that you might see on Mars before. And I too have seen those, okay? But I'm, I'm completely convinced it's my mind, you know, as I might look up at clouds and see, you know, an old, old guy smoking a pipe or something or, you know, bunny rabbit or something like that in the clouds. You know, I, we're constantly wanting to make shapes out of things, you know, whether it's shadows or anything that's kind of uh, fuzzy and uh, not very defined. But we I think there's an attempt to always make it more defined. Uh, and I'm not the only guy that's seen this. Uh, obviously, of course, Percival Lowell did, but um, uh, Mike Wiesner talks about it as well. And uh, well, the, look, look, Scott, your brain is hardwired to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know you're in the jungle, or well, I don't know how much time you spend in the jungle, but if you're in the jungle and you see something moving through the trees, and you figure, oh, my God, you know, there could be a lion, right? most of the time you're going to be wrong and so oh no it was just a trick of my brain but on the other hand if it is a line and you fail to recognize it the penalty is greater so <laughs> so nature has selected for you to be uh to to be 
you know, suspe- uh, susceptible, I'm sorry, to uh, filling in the blanks in your visual yeah. field. Right? Maybe it's a survival thing. It, well, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for honoring us with the talk today, uh, Seth, and um, uh, hopefully you get some rest uh, between trips here. So yeah. I, I did want to mention, um, you know, of course, uh, Seth is the senior astronomer at SETI. He's very actively involved in uh, the search for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. He's also part of a program called Big Picture Science. He's the host of that show. So you can go to bigpicturescience.com com or dot org maybe org. Dot org? Dot yeah. com. Dot, dot, org. dot org big picture science dot org and uh, uh, he puts together a weekly program so thanks a lot and um, uh, we will see you next time Seth take care I hope so okay. yeah thanks bye bye okay. okay so uh up next um is uh Ron uh Bre- Breacher Ron and I met for the first time at this year's Northeast Astronomy Forum. And uh, I quickly learned that he's an extremely talented astrophotographer, uh, is a master of uh, image processing programs like PixInsight. Uh, he teaches uh, astrophotography. So if you're so inclined to, you know, if you need a, a master photographer so that you too can uh, uh, produce images that uh, will stun the world, um, uh, you know, Ron is, is certainly one of the go-to guys for this. Uh, it's his first time on Global Star Party. Um, we talked a little bit backstage and uh, uh, he, he was thanking us for having him come on after so many uh, pretty famous people <laughs> in astronomy. Um, but uh, he's one of the guys too. And I think you're going to find out uh, that Ron is very friendly and um, uh, you know, uh, guy, but also someone that is just extremely talented. And so thanks for coming in to share your work with us. Hey there, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. I'm blushing listening to that introduction. <laughs> Thank you. It's all yours. So today, um, I want to unfold the cosmos in a slightly different way. In st- instead of just unfolding in space, I want to think about unfolding the cosmos in time as well. So let me share my screen with you. Um, Give me a second here. And you should be able to see my slides now. And uh, so the title of my talk is Telescopes, Time Machines, and Treasures of the Night. And I'm going to talk about all three of those. Uh, Since this is my first time on the show, uh, Scott asked me to throw in a bio slide. This is me in a very happy moment in the observatory, sipping on a black currant cider. Uh, I've been imaging since 2006, but I've always been interested in the sky ever since I was a, a young boy. I spent my summers up in Algonquin Park, where the sky was just uh, full of jewels all the time. I love to teach and I love to write. so. I've become a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope. I'm an associate editor for Amateur Astronomy. And I do a lot of teaching, both one-on-one and through the website, mastersofpixinsight.com. And I'm a a PixInsight ambassador, uh, which I guess they recognize me for the way I I teach PixInsight. If you want to get hold of me, my, my email address is on the slide, and the slide's on the video. So there you have it. Today, I want to, uh, I'm going to start with an analogy of a car. So we're going to have to put our seatbelts on and uh, try to convince you that telescopes are time machines. Then we're going to go and unfold the cosmos from near to far. And if there's a few minutes left and people have questions in the chat box, I'll try to answer them. So let's start out by thinking about traveling in a car at 100 kilometers per hour. I'm north of the US border up in Canada where we're on the metric system like most of our friends in Europe. Uh, 100 kilometers an hour is about 60 miles an hour. And suppose you never stop for any reason. That's just like a male driver, just like a dad. I would never wanna stop on those long drives. How long would it take you to go around the earth or to the moon or to the sun? Well, it takes a long time. If you were just going at 100 kilometers an hour, it would take you 16 and a half days just to go around the Earth. 
and about six months to get to the moon. If you decided you wanted to go the 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers to the sun, it would take you about 170 years. But now let's travel in a light car instead. So now suppose we're driving at the speed of light. You never stop for any reason. Now it would only take you a little more than a tenth of a second to get around the Earth. One and a quarter seconds to get to the moon. And if you wanted to get from here to the sun, it would take you about eight minutes and 20 seconds. Now, the really important thing not only is not only that light travels incredibly quickly, but that these times aren't zero. Light doesn't travel infinitely quickly. It takes time for light to travel. So the light from things that are far away takes time to get to us, to get to our eye. And, and at the kinds of distances that we're talking about in the cosmos, it would take more than four years just to get to the closest star, Proxima Centauri. And if you wanted to go to galaxies, the closest galaxies, I mean, our satellite galaxies to the Milky Way are hundreds of thousands uh, of light years. And uh, galaxies like Andromeda, millions of light years, and galaxy clusters that are billions of light years away. So we see things as they were, not as they are. And the further away an object is, the further back in time we're looking when we, when we image it or when we look through an eyepiece. So that's why I said telescopes are time machines. They allow us to look into the distant past and they reveal objects to us that the eye alone cannot see. And that's not just fainter objects, but further objects as well. So in that way, telescopes are time machines. And I also want to give out a shout out to my wife, Gail, here. It's not just the telescope that's the time machine. The telescope is just helping you to gather, harvest the photons. The real time machine is in your head. It's in your eye and your brain and how your mind puts all of that information together. That's where the time machine. So here's a few of my time machines that I've owned over the years. And uh, I'm showing this because if you're a beginner, I don't want you to think you have to spend a ton of money to get started in astronomy. The six inch reflector at the lower left of this slide is probably my most used telescope. It takes two minutes to set up. I've never had to adjust or clean the mirrors and I've had it over 25 years. You can buy one for a few hundred dollars and that will include everything you need to get started. So what can we see with our time machines? So here I wanna go near to far and we're gonna start at the earth and nearby, move out to the solar system where we can look at the sun, uh, moon and planets. Then we're gonna look at some objects inside our galaxy and then go out beyond the Milky Way to galaxies and star clusters as we unfold the cosmos. So let's start with Earth and nearby. This is one of the first astrophotos I ever took, and it was February 20th, 2008. It was about minus 25C outside, and I was using a digital SLR, a digital Rebel 350, one of the very first, and it was on a, a nice tracking mount and right after I got the picture on the right, everything froze up and I never got another frame. So timing is everything. I took the picture at left just before the eclipse began and the picture at right at mid eclipse and then everything froze up. Crepuscular rays happen when the sun is below the horizon and poking through the clouds. And just a reminder, the best equipment to use for astrophotography is the equipment you already have. Equipment like your cell phone or a point and shoot camera. These are just beautiful effects that happen once in a while. This is my Aurora Angel from March 2003. We had a huge outburst at the end of March of that year. And this was directly overhead. It was... Uh, um, also, one of the first photos I took, I didn't even know about camera raw and fit files. This was just a JPEG, a four second picture with the camera held straight up over my head. 
solar system. So the solar system is fantastic through any visual instrument, whether you're looking at the moon or the planets. Here, I've got uh, Jupiter and Venus. Jupiter is to the upper left of Venus in the sunset shot. It's right under my mouse cursor. I hope you can see it here. Maybe I can make the cursor go. There it is. And Venus to the lower right. And my friend Daryl Archer got this picture of Jupiter here on the right. Fantastic. And Saturn, the thing that totally got me hooked on astronomy was my first look at Saturn. Once you've seen Saturn, there's no going back. And Mars at lower right. I actually got a picture of Mars. This one is by my friend Daryl Archer, but I got a picture of Mars, Mars with a Polaroid camera held up to the eyepiece. And you know, it's not bad. This is a photo that I took of a solar eclipse in 2014. Um, this used a hydrogen alpha telescope and a color video camera. And I shot for about two minutes, took the best frames and combined them. And we're still in the solar system, of course. And with, with David Levy kicking off the show today, I would be remiss if I didn't have a slide about comets. So here's a few of the comets that I've shot. Uh, Comet 7P Holmes. Comet C2022 E3ZTF up at upper right, Z for those of you south of the border. And on the far left, um, Comet C2022, oh, I've got the wrong label on that. That's Comet, uh, Comet Linear. I have to make a change to that label, li uh, label. Okay, so now we're gonna leave the solar system. These comets come from the furthest reaches of the solar system. So we're going to leave our solar system, but stay within the Milky Way galaxy. And I want to sh show you just a few of my, my favorite objects. And, and I should say everything I'm going to show you here, almost everything I'm going to show you here, you can see with the naked eye, with binoculars, or with a very, very modest telescope. Most of these can be seen well with the naked eye. And certainly this is an example of a great naked eye or binocular object, the double cluster in Perseus. Um, these, this is an example of an open cluster, actually a pair of them. These stars were all born around the same time out of the same cloud of gas. And there's a few hundred of them here. Remember that's a few hundred because we're gonna talk about a different kind of cluster in a minute that, uh, that has way more stars. So a few hundred in each of these clusters, a lot of hot blue stars that live fast and die young. And open clusters don't tend to last that long. Over time, they move apart. Here's probably the most famous open cluster. This is uh, the Pleiades, the seven sisters in Japan, they call this Subaru. Um, in Costa Rica, they call this the Siete Cabritas, the seven little goats. And um, it's another example of an open cluster, uh, but it's surrounded by all this faint gas and dust that you can see as light brown, particularly in the lower right of this image. This is fantastic with the naked eye. It's beautiful in binoculars and it's exquisite in a small telescope. Whatever optic you have, you can use it on M45. Now, I said I was going to show you a different kind of cluster. Here's an example of a globular cluster. This cluster uh, is associated with the Milky Way. It's within the Milky Way's halo. Most galaxies have globular clusters, and the Milky Way has about 150 of them. Each of these globular clusters contains tens of thousands to millions of stars. Not quite as not quite big enough to be a small galaxy, and they don't really look anything like galaxies. They look through the eyepiece. Bright examples of these clusters looks like sugar spilled on a black tablecloth. They have a beautiful granularity to them. And again, you don't need a big telescope to get a beautiful view of a globular cluster. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's come back inside the body of the galaxy 
to look at some nebulas. Now, this is an interesting image. It contains the bubble nebula down here. And all the red here is mostly coming from glowing hydrogen that gas. There's a very bright star at the center, just to the right of center of the bubble nebula. I'm making, uh, I hope you can see it flashing here. Um, that star is emitting a large amount of energy that's causing the surrounding hydrogen gas to glow. What happens is the electrons get excited and as they release their energy, the energy is released in the form of visible, mostly red light. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, but there's not just bright nebulas here. If you look down here, bottom center, there's a dark nebula here where there's obscuring dust blocking out the light behind it. And of course, in the upper right, we have another example of a beautiful open cluster of a few hundred stars. Uh, we may have lost Ron here. We're gonna hang in there for a moment and see if he comes back. Still sharing a screen, so it's an, it's an amazing view. It is an amazing view. <laughs> yeah, Let's sit back and enjoy this for a second, you know. <laughs> Here, let me text him. He's still alive, so yeah, he might not know that he's dropped out. You know, it is the first time that Ron come here, so oh, okay. the, so he has... If you have a connection issues, it's it usually to be uh, when you are first here, I have it. <laughs> I think Molly have it. Everybody has it. So Hi there. Oh, we have him back. Oh, so you made it back. Yay. Yay. I that I'm gonna chalk up to a gamma ray burst or something like that. So <laughs> a solar flare with the with the satellite. <laughs> Sorry Molly, about that, gang. Yeah, would you like to finish up here? Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. Okay. Let me uh get back to that slide and give me one second here to sure. just get the the zoom thing going properly i i don't know what happened i think it was my internet must have cut out must have been there we go. that happens happened to me before too all right so i was just saying one of the things i like about the horse head is that it has every kind of nebula in it it has the the red emission nebula it's got dark nebula head itself is a dark nebula right oopsie right this is a finger of of soot that's projecting up and blocking the light behind it we have reflection nebula this blue up below center and we have the flame nebula at left which is a combination of several different kinds of nebula so this is just a, a really cool picture and of course, within our galaxy, and I can't wait to hear about the latest one of these, because uh, this is a supernova remnant. And uh, we're going to hear in the next talk about a new supernova that might leave a remnant kind of like this. This is the Veil Nebula. And the red comes from hydrogen. The teal color comes from oxygen. Again, oxygen atoms got getting uh, excited and releasing their light as green and blue wavelengths. And here's another way that that supernova might look down the line. This is the Crab Nebula, another type of supernova remnant. And now we're going beyond the Milky Way. Now, one of the things I love about this uh, shot of the Andromeda Galaxy is it really unfolds the universe. Think about this. The bottom part of the Andromeda Galaxy in this image, the part closest to the lower right is about 100,000 light years closer to us than the furthest part of this galaxy at the upper left. So not only are we looking back in time, but we're looking back at every period of time for that 100,000 years and all of the time in between us and it. Wow, mind blown. And here's going to be the subject of the next talk, so I'm not going to say too much about it, 
except that it's a beautiful galaxy well-placed for imaging right now. Here's an, another galaxy, Centaurus A in the Southern Hemisphere, that has these really cool radio jets coming out of it at the upper left and a great dark lane in the middle. And you know, galaxies don't just come one at a time. Usually they come in bunches like Easter eggs in the spring. And uh, it's not just the galaxies that you can see that are in this bunch. Here's an annotated version of the same image that shows some of the hundreds of galaxies that are tiny fuzzy spots in this picture. And for my last picture, I'm going hundreds of millions of light years away to show you the Perseus A galaxy cluster. Again, you can image this with modest equipment. You can't see these galaxies through the eyepiece unless you have a huge instrument. But uh, you can look at this spot and you'll know that they're there. Mm. Let, that, let those photons hit your eye. Anyway, with that, uh, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I know time is short and I'm looking forward to the presentation on 101. Yes. Oh, thank you, Ron. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, certainly a lot of great comments from our our um, audience. Uh, they're pretty happy that you're here. So, um, and uh, uh, we are too. So, thank you very much for being on our thank program, you. and we hope to have you again. You're welcome anytime. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. So. Uh, up next is uh, Molly Wakeling. Uh, Molly uh, uh, promised to give another Astronomy uh, program, and she is focused on M101 and this amazing Type 2 supernova. And so, um, Molly, thanks for coming on to Global Star Party, and it's all yours. Yeah, thanks, and happy to be back. I think it's been uh, two months since the last time I was on, and I try to make it on once a month. So, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been very, very busy with school, of course. Um, yeah, so uh, I like to try and think of topic of uh, like targets for this uh, the segment that has something to do with the theme of the show, but with the supernova and M one on one being the big news right now. Of course, I have to talk about it, and it didn't look like anybody else was going to cover it. So I'm like, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so and I and I I've got I got a picture of it on um Sunday night. Uh so I'll be showing that as well. Um but yeah, let me go ahead and get rolling here. Okay. You know, I'm a little yeah. jealous for that. <laughs> I, I can't even see it through the horizon here. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess I guess y'all are missing out on this one in the southern hemisphere. Um, but uh yeah, it's it's pretty spectacular. And I got to I got to see it visually as well on Sunday night through a 16 inch daub and yeah it's it's very apparent it's very bright it's awesome <laughs> it's I see it saw supernova with my eyeball <laughs> very exciting uh, yeah so it has been it has been designated 2023 IXF in whatever the probably International Astronomical Union's designation scheme is for these which I didn't go look up as part of this talk. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, 2023 IXF is a very exciting name for this. <laughs> um, is it gonna... oh, that's not fair. <laughs> Sorry, I had the laser pointer mode on. Looks like, well, let me click to the next slide with it on. Okay. Um, so it, uh, it's in Galaxy Messier 101, and it was discovered just on Friday, uh, Friday on uh, May 19th, by a Japanese amateur astronomer, uh, Koichi Itagaki, Itagaki in uh, Yamagata, Japan. And it looks like from the location of his observatory, he's actually in like downtown uh, uh, Tepocho, um, which is like Bortles 8 or something like that. Okay, Kat, I need you to not put your tail in front of my ca camera screen. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my camera. He likes to, he, he hears me talk. The tail is like a screen button. cleaner, right? <laughs> Yeah, he, he hears me talk on Zoom and he's like, I have to go, I have to go put my butt on display. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was using a 14 inch telescope uh, with a CAF 1001E chip, which is a pretty sensitive chip, but it's it was a 14.9 magnitude at discovery, which is not especially dim. Uh, any one of us, I think with uh, 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 probably uh, 
eight inch or larger telescope could have picked it up in, in subframes, I think. Uh, if we if we actually go back and look through our data, and I've been think I've been planning on writing some kind of uh, change detection algorithm to compare my galaxy images because I I almost discovered a supernova like my in my second year of doing astrophotography. It was uh, it came out about three days after uh, after I imaged it, and I went and looked, and there it was. <laughs> I just hadn't compared the images to a month before, so I want to start doing some of that too. Uh, it's been uh, it's estimated that it is a type two supernova. I think based on its its light curve and its spectra so far, um, which is a core collapse supernova. I'm going to talk about what that is and why they're so freaking cool. <laughs> um, but first of all, if you would like to go find it for yourself, Messier 101 is uh, not too difficult to go hunt down. It's off of the uh, end of the tail of the Big Dipper, and where M51 is is below. That tail M101 is above. Uh, so uh, the uh, well, the tail of the bear, the handle of the Big Dipper. Uh, bears apparently have tails in, in ancient Greece. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's where it's located in the sky, pretty far north. And my fast facts slide here. I was uh, magnitude 11 as of last night. That's the latest observations that I've seen. Uh, and I think it was about magnitude I estimate about 12 to 12.5 um, on uh, the night that I imaged it. So it continues to brighten. It's 21 million light years away, which means that this supernova actually occurred 21 million years ago in, inside of SCA 101. And it's taken that light 21 million years to reach us. So this supernova is long over, but we're just now finally getting to see it ourselves. It's on the outer arm of M101 as uh, you can see in the in the picture here. That's the discovery image. Um, it's uh, There was a, another supernova in M101 in 2011. <clears throat> and uh, so not too long ago, actually. And it's actually, the, it's the closest supernova to us in the last decade. So more or less since this last M101 one, I believe. There's actually another supernova happening right now as well in the uh, butterfly galaxies, formerly known as the Siamese Twins galaxies. Uh, NGC, uh, gosh, what was it? 50, 40, 45, 67, and 8, I think. Um, and that one's like, my friends are telling me it's like magnitude 15 or so, so a bit darker, a bit dimmer. But uh, yeah, that's another supernova to go check out as well. Uh, so let's talk about what type 2 supernova are. So um, stars that are of 8 to 50 solar masses, so solar masses being a unit of measure, that's the mass of our sun. Uh, we say that because putting stellar masses in terms of kilograms would just be enormous numbers that are difficult to work with. So we just say eight to 50 solar masses. Uh, stars of that mass can undergo this type of explosion. And basically what happens is, uh, so the star is going about its, its life, burning, fusing hydrogen into helium, and eventually starts to run out of the hydrogen. So and what's happening inside the star is the outward pressure of the energy produced from the fusion process is counteracting the inward pull of gravity. And the two are in a balance. And when it starts to run out of hydrogen to burn, it takes more energy to burn helium. So it can't quite do that. And there's not enough energy coming out of the core to counteract gravity. So the star begins to shrink. And as it shrinks, it heats up, kind of like when you compress a gas. It's exactly like when you compress a gas. And um, that makes it hot enough to be able to start fusing helium. So fusion begins again, except helium this time, and the star is back in, in balance, and it can continue to not fall inward from the force of gravity. Well, eventually it runs out of helium, and then it has to start burning carbon instead, uh, where it, it, there's another shrinking of a shrinking period of time, it gets hotter again, then it can start burning carbon. And this happens with a couple other elements up the periodic table with neon and uh, oxygen and silicon. And then uh, finally you get up to it trying to fuse iron. And iron's at the top of this curve where you don't get energy out of it when you fuse it. And it actually requires some energy to, for that fusion to happen. So the star is no longer able to produce energy to resist the pull of gravity. 
And then what happens next happens very quickly <laughs> where um, the, uh, the, the core starts, starts to compress and it compresses until it reaches what's known as the Chandrasekhar limit, which is about 1.4 uh, solar, I said solar mass, I think I meant solar radii there um, I, in my notes there. Um, and this is the, the size at which the electron degeneracy pressure, which is what's counteracting the, gra the gravity here, can no longer work against the gravity. And this causes a sudden implosion, the, the core collapse. And that's kind of the start of our supernova process. There's a couple of other things that happen first. So uh, one cool, interesting fact is that the infalling material moves as fast as 23% of the speed of light <laughs> as that implosion is occurring, which is insane. The temperature skyrockets to 100 billion degrees, which is 10,000 times hotter than the sun's core. And you might say, well, do you mean Fahrenheit or Celsius to Kelvin? Well, when it's 100 billion, they're all the same. So <laughs> 100 billion degrees in whatever units you care to use. Um, and in, in this uh, simulation image here, the blue circle edge here is the shock wave, the, this, this circle here. Uh, and the red parts are inward motion, I'm sorry, outward motion, and the blue parts are inward motion. And then um, uh, neutrons and neutrinos are, in, in, during this process, are released via reverse beta decay, also known as electron capture, um, which uh, when, when it produces the, the neutrinos, the neutrinos will actually carry, or, uh, carry away a lot of the energy. And by a lot, I mean 10 to the power of 46 joules in about 10 seconds. Now, hold on. <laughs> How much energy is 10 to the power of 46 joules? How much energy are the neutrinos, which rarely interact, carrying away from this Im Im sudden implosion? Well, uh, when I was coming up with a talk on cellular nuclear on, uh, on, uh, on nucleosynthesis several years ago for the Texas Star Party, I wanted to try and find some way to make this incomprehensibly huge number, which is which is 10 with 46 zeros after it. <laughs> it put it into some kind of still incomprehensible, but somewhat more comprehensible terms. So I thought, well, a popular unit of, of measuring a large amount of energy is how many Hiroshima detonations, Hiroshima nuclear bombs is 10 to the 46 joules. So I, I know from, from my uh, physics work that uh, one kiloton, which is what we use, the kiloton of, of TNT equivalents, which, which is what we use to measure the intensity of uh, uh, nuclear detonations, is about 10 to the 12 joules. So that means that uh, Hiroshima being, uh, that detonation being 15 kilotons, that bombing about 15 kilotons, is about 10 to the 13 joules. So that means that one supernova, uh, or the, at least the energy carried away by the, by the neutrons, 10 to the 46 joules is 10 to the power of 33 Hiroshima's. That's still like not a great number to be dealing with. So let's let's put let's see like uh, wh what's another number that has a lot as a large exponent. Well, how about the number of seconds in the age of the universe? So how many is that? So there's about 10 to the seven seconds in a year, and the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So we'll just say 10 to the 10 years. And so that means that the number of seconds in the age of the universe is about 10 to the 17 seconds. So what this all means at the end of the day is that one supernova or the, uh, even just the energy that the neutrinos carry away, which is not all the energy in the supernova, is 10 to the 16 or 10 quadrillion Hiroshima detonations per second for the age of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> if you could ever comprehend such an incredible amount of energy. <laughs> so uh, there's your, your brain exploder for the day. Yes. And uh, so 1% uh, of those neutrinos, 10 to the 44 joules, is reabsorbed in the shock wave, which is what actually, which is what makes the supernova explosion explode, is, is that 10 to the 44 joules going into the shock wave from those neutrinos, which rarely interact, but interact often enough in all the craziness happening in the star to dump a bunch of energy, 10 to the 44 joules into the explosion. All right, so back to what is happening inside of our detonation here. So, um, yeah, so we we get uh, uh, 
we get neutrons and neutrinos are released in electron capture decay uh, over those 10 seconds. And how that happens is gammas that are produced from the uh, suddenly very much higher temperature, this 100 billion kelvins, gamma rays, uh, go on and photo disintegrate the iron <laughs> nuclei that are in the core and basically break it up into a whole bunch of helium-4 nuclei, which is something we called alpha particles in, in nuclear physics, but uh, he they're helium-4 nuclei and also a bunch and also quite a few neutrons. And with uh, with all the energy going on in here, it's actually energetically favorable for electrons to combine with protons in this process of electron capture and can and basically turns the proton into a neutron and a neutrino. So that's those are the neutrinos that are escaping our system and carrying away 10 to the 46 joules or 10 quadrillion Hiroshima's every second for the age of the universe. And uh, so and, and then the, the core is continuing to implode and eventually it reaches a very, very dense state where uh, it's as dense as as an as the core of an atom, as the as the atomic nucleus, and it's it pauses briefly because it has reached this limit of neutron degeneracy, where um, you can't you can't compress it further because of the neutrons repulsion with each other, effectively, um, and then this causes the shock wave to bounce and then bounce back out. And that accelerates the cellular material that was above the iron core because there's a lot of layers of, of uh, other types of, of elements that are above the core. And um, this is this is the actual material like it's blown out and all that light that we see from the explosion. And we are left with an extremely dense core of basically neutron matter, which is a neutron star. And it, if, uh, but if the star is above, it's above 20 solar masses, it can actually go from there and, and collapse fully into a black hole. And it's speculated that above, uh, let me get my last picture up here, <laughs> above about 40 to 50 solar masses, uh, the star, a star is thought to collapse directly into a black hole and actually skip the whole supernova thing, but we're not sure that, that actually happens. So that's some speculation from some models, but there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, so if you want to go observe this incredible phenomenon with your own naked eye, you can do so. And it's at magnitude 11 as of last night. Uh, it may still be continuing to brighten. It's well within reach of pretty much any telescope. Um, magnitude 11 stars are not hard to pick out with uh, mm -hmm. with any kind of magnification. Um, I'm not sure about, I'm not quite sure about binoculars. Maybe you need to be under some darker skies, but definitely like a three or four inch refractor can, can pick it up for you. Uh, now, the galaxy itself has relatively low surface brightness, so it can be hard to pick out from the background if you are under any kind of light pollution. Or right now, Ohio is covered in smoke from, from wildfires in Canada. So when I was trying to observe it in the 16-inch Dobsonian out at the at my astronomy club's dark sky site, which is Bortle 5, hello, Kitty, um, then uh, I actually couldn't really see the galaxy, but looking at at some other nearby stars and kind of triangulating with some images that uh, uh, on like a, uh, a show that area, I was able to um, find with with some help of another astronomer in the club uh, where the supernova was at. And we were pretty sure that, that we were looking at it, which was great. Um, you can help yourself see the actual galaxy by going to, this, to some darker skies, larger apertures, or using some light pollution filters. I have seen it uh, readily in my eight inch schmidt cassegrain before with a light pollution filter when there's not so much smoke in the air and or it, you can see the supernova without being able to see the rest of the galaxy but it does make it a little bit easier to find when you can see that kind of dim fuzzy core of of m101 photographically it shows up readily in images i wasn't sure how many images i was going to have to take because I, I thought it might have still been around magnitude 14 or 13 uh, but it, by the time I imaged it, it was probably somewhere closer to magnitude 12, and it popped right out in my in a single five minute subframe. It was very obvious, very easy to see, and uh, that was on a four inch f5 refractor under Bortle five skies. You could probably do it under worse conditions with uh, longer focal length scopes and um, uh, shorter exposure times because it is it is quite bright. Uh, I would use a wide band light pollution filter or luminance filter so that you get the most of the light from the star and also try and pick up the galaxy as well. And you can stack several frames to be able to see the rest of M101 nicely to kind of put it in context with where it is in the galaxy. Uh, the picture here on the slide is a sketch from a user on Cloudy Nights named uh, Raul Leon. 
and uh, kind of showing where it's at mm -hmm. when you can actually see M M101 nicely in the eyepiece. Um, I, there was, there's two bright stars kind of here in, in this field of view that's not in his particular telescope field of view, but they're roughly uh, here that, um, that kind of uh, pointed the way to, uh, to that uh, mm -hmm. supernova. Uh, so here is uh, an image uh, from a guy, uh, Martin Bracken, that I found online that is showing kind of the sequence of events night by night of it getting brighter. So um, the the area, um, I'm not sure if if this here, I think this is actually this what, what we have here is is a nebula. I don't think you can actually see the individual star here. Um, but then uh, on the day of discovery, you can see that it's certainly something is happening because this is much bigger than it used to be. And it just gets brighter and brighter on the subsequent nights. Here's a nice image from Adam Block where uh, the image on the left is the current one uh, from, from the, night, the night of the 19th when it was discovered. And uh, an earlier image that he took where you can clearly see that it's not there. So that's pretty cool. And uh, here's another image from uh, that, that I found online. Cat, you're blocking my screen again. Go over here, <laughs> where you can uh, kind of see see it appear there. And then uh, here's here's my image. So on the left is an image I took last spring uh, through the same telescope, but with my monochrome camera. And you can see there's something there. And then here's the image I took with that same telescope, but with a color camera on on Sunday night. And yeah, there's a supernova. I picked it up in my image and like, yeah, it's very cool just to have, have captured it myself in the camera and then also have seen it visually with my eyes. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, the M101 supernova. You should try and observe it or image it for sure. Woo, okay. Wonderful, thank you, Molly. Thank you. Some uh, great examples of uh, uh, comparison photos. And uh, I loved watching the, um, the growth or the brighten, brightening part of a supernova. That, that's something um, that I think has not been captured very often. Um, there was yeah. a gentleman that uh, I remember back in the, is either in the 70s or 80s, um, his name, name will come to me in a moment, but uh, his claim to fame uh, was shooting a movie uh, aimed at, um, uh, the sky, and he actually captured the moment that a supernova exploded. And oh, wow. um, yeah, so um, um, I'll have to see if I can find that, dig that out. Um, but uh, really, really a stunning moment. So, uh, Scott, I think the, yeah. the first man that could capture uh, it was from Argentina, from Rosario. Uh, he's a key master because he works in his store uh, selling keys to the doors and he's an uh, amateur astro photographer. He has uh, 12 inches in his rooftop and he captured uh, at the first time in a single night the sequence where a supernova comes. Uh, there's a documentary that of uh, Discovery Channel, I remember that uh, astronomer from uh, USA, they uh, name, uh, his name is um, e e Buso, uh, of his last name, I remember. Okay. Uh, he's friend of Cesar. <laughs> mm, wow. He's talked about him before on their program, so that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, and amateurs <laughs> discover supernovae and variable stars and comets all the time and you know because we have thousands of telescopes across the world that are observing every night and we yeah. can point them wherever we want and and we've got a lot of eyes a lot more eyes on the sky than the professional astronomers do and yeah. so it, it pays to go <laughs> sorry my cat <laughs> it That's pays right. to go and go and do some comparisons on your data because you you just might catch the next supernova and magnitude 14 okay he's laying on my mouse now uh magnitude 14 15 is is definitely within reach of of um of astrophotos for sure uh that's a magnitude i typically reach with my uh scientific imaging rig with only one minute exposures um stacking just a couple of those so um yeah definitely keep your eyes out because you might discover the next one that's right. That's right. Okay, guys. So uh, at this point, Molly, thank you so much. Um, yeah, totally. We're going to take a, um, 
a dozen minutes here. Uh, I've got a another segment of uh, NASA's uh, uh, visualization, uh, scientific visualization studio. They put together something like four or five different um, videos with uh, with an original symphonic score. And uh, so this one has to do with uh, with the planets. And so we're going to we're going to give that a watch. But in the meantime, you can go grab a um, sandwich or uh, take a break, stretch your legs, and we'll come back with more Global Star Party.
I hope you enjoyed that. I did, some of you asked where that uh, link was for that video. I, I put the link in the chat so you can check on it. Uh, there's, I think, five different videos uh, by that composer. So uh, enjoy and share those with your astronomy clubs. Uh, I think you'll find it, uh, you know, a, a great presentation piece. Um, also, uh, you know, just something nice to listen to. Uh, as uh, I think it was Norm Hughes said with headphones on. So anyhow, um, our next speaker is Maxi Filares. Uh, Ma Maxi is often on, um, on Global Star Party. He, is, uh, he tunes in from the Southern Hemisphere in Argentina. He is an amazing astrophotographer. Uh, uh, he started with very, very humble equipment making uh, you know, really mind-blowing images. Uh, uh, the first time that we had him on Global Star Party, he was uh, showing us images that he had made with a cell phone camera where he'd taken the lens out and just had the sensor exposed. And uh, so and there it is. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want somebody to modify your cell phone, maybe you can send it to Maxi in Argentina. And for a small fee, he'll make one for you. So anyhow, Maxi, thanks very much for coming on to Global Star Party. I, I know it's getting late for you. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Hello, Scott and everyone. Hello, Molly, and, and thank you for invi inviting. Um, well, tonight what I'm going to talk about is what I'll be doing last uh, weekend and day before that, that in the last GSP that we were, uh, I was taking pictures of uh, the, um, or try to capture the lobster nebula that is in the tail of Scorpio and uh, using an L extreme filter of 1.25 inches, a very small filter. But anyway, with my sensor of my, the camera, uh, I don't have any trouble uh, for uh, have a vignetting. So anyway, let me share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. Great. Well, um, for example, that I was, uh, let me go to Pix Insight. Oh, sorry. Uh, go to uh, the lights of that I took. This is the a single picture of the place using this filter. Uh, this is only a three minutes sub uh, wow. at at gain uh, 100 i think 101 but also i took pictures of the same object only to to try to how we how we see it without the filter before that uh, to put it on the camera so this is the the difference you know if i I didn't uh, use the filter. Let me put it. This is sixty percent, and this is the the same. Wowie! There's a huge difference. Oh yeah. So uh, I had a little uh, rotating of the field of view <laughs> to to put out the. the... That's okay. <laughs> so, wow. well, I leave the the equipment. I, I think it was, uh, yeah, almost midnight and taking pictures to almost uh, 6 and a half a.m., almost before the, uh, the sunrise. So, well, uh, I stack these uh, pictures, try to, to see what I get. And this is the, the full stack image of the L extreme. You know, this is a auto stretching image because <laughs> it's all black, but when I stretch it, you can see all the details. That looks great. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm i still uh, working out to how to process this kind of images because in this case, I'm working with the L extreme filter so the colors are not the same and even uh, the stars are not the same that if i took pictures of without the, that filter 
So anyway, I started to process this image. I my my first uh, work was this. You know, it gets me a lot of red, and a lot of uh, friends told me, you know, this 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 is a huge of red. All uh, another one says, man, this is amazing. I love this huge red, this uh, bright in red. But it was my my first uh, try to well, my first time to try to to process this picture, and also try to process this um, object because I tried it last year, and for the light pollution, I it was really awful. I have different colors, but for the light pollution, so with this filter helped me to process this like it was a clean night, you know, but it was in my backyard in Bortley six by or seven almost. And then I reprocess the same object, changing the uh, patterns of the, 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 the way that, that I process. And in this case, you can see it is more like kind of orange, not too much red. Uh, but I I get really shiny stars, so I say now, Maxi, let's go back and try again. So I tried with the um, the the script uh, called uh, Forex that a friend Ariel Capelletti told me about. So I was uh, pra practicing with this, and I really loved how how goes with this kind of process it's more like a fire you know in the sky in, in the deep space in our galaxy and also the colors of the stars i really liked it uh, what does that script do well basically what it does uh, when you you know i'm working with the rgb um, a color camera so i have to build the H alpha and the O3 by separate using this filter. So uh, basically, uh, let me show you in a couple of minutes. It is a process very, very uh, quickly. Uh, for example, I have this starless. Uh, this is uh, without stretching, okay? But this program, what it does, uh, it works better if you stretch the image but before that this is uh, you know you can see is a color shot so i have this um, um pixel math process that i could get because if i uh, the, a formula to generate the all three uh, based in um, taking from this rgb uh, picture uh, maybe Molly, if I, I if you want to, I, I I can send you the 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 video that I took this uh, to if you want to work out. Um, that could be fun. When I sorry, uh, I I have to before that I have to separate the RGB. You can see a uh, channel uh, in in Spanish, rojo, verde, o azul, or brain green, or blue. When I do this, I have the three channels by separated. Okay, you can see the red, but in the blue, that's almost nothing compared with this. And also, we have a lot of uh, sorry um, noise. Noise. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, anyway, I put this pixel math uh, formula to this to generate the all three. Okay. So uh, without uh, with, with this formula, when I turn this, I have the all three data because in the That's blue, very cool. it's very different. You can see it's a, a less noisy, of course, but it's okay. So to generate the H alpha, of course, uh, it will get from the red channel almost. So when I do it, this generates me the H alpha. 
So then what I'm going to do, I close, I will close this. And I I will out um, use a masked stretch because I, I really like to how it works in this case. But uh, I the the last uh, sorry the last of this I added the the stars because in this script you can work with the stars or without the stars. In this case, I I saved the five without the stars. So I will out uh, a max, max stretching this object is very quickly. And you can see it's almost fine without too much. Uh, it, it doesn't look like very noisy. And also the O3. I'm ready. Uh, who's ready? <laughs> 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 I got some. Uh, I've gotten some nice results with with mask stretch, and I'd kind of forgotten about it after using generalized hyperbolic stretch for a while. That I was reprocessing some images and saw <laughs> that I had used mask stretch, and I was like, "Oh yeah,", yeah. and yeah, you know, it I, does sometimes work better. <laughs> I, you know, I I didn't I didn't like the general uh, hyper. Uh, I don't know how to the G H yeah. uh -huh, stretch. G -H. That, mm -hmm. Mm, I, I didn't like that. Uh, even it takes some it, practice for sure. I, I think uh, so, but in the galaxies, uh, it doesn't work with me. I'm but, in position. Um, well, then I go to the script. Well, I downloaded uh, and it goes forex pa palette utility. This is all the, the process. And I will choose the, the option to have two channels. In this case, the H alpha and the O3. I have I haven't the S2 because I don't have that kind of info. So let's put it on the H alpha and the O3. If I don't check this, uh, it will I, I had to add the stars to work uh, with that. So I will execute it. This is a really, a really good uh, tool, and uh, then we have the 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 image. So, in this case, is not lineal uh, info. So you have to start to well, you can go with curves. You know, put it more. Uh, contrast, increase the, the saturation, uh, and all of that. And I think that's, uh, in this case, I, because I don't have the stars, it, it, it processed different. But anyway, I let me, oh, yeah. And of where course, can you, where can you get this this uh, script? Um, I have the, um, sorry. Uh, be under uh, uh, updates under resources yeah. resources now i have the bar of the zoom meeting manager repositories. Uh, repositories here's ah. https uh, utility.com slash fpu okay yeah okay so well and when you watch this again you you can see and then you process of course, uh, if you have the blur exterminator or the noise exterminator and everything, and you can add the, the stars, you know, I really like to work the blur exterminator without the stars and then put it again because I really love how it looks like. It, it, it looks like very smooth stars, not like pointed, shiny stars. So, uh, well, I think uh, this is uh, going to for tonight. Uh, and also, uh, when I did the last uh, Saturday afternoon, he was trying to capture our sun because it has a lot of uh, activity. And you can see I, I could almost have five images and then stack it because some clouds came by and then the the trees start to to put it in front of but anyway we can start to see a lot of a uh, uh, sunspots that's really, really uh, pretty much cool 
and uh, of course you will need a protection like um, solar filter uh, uh, to see this uh, now you you can watch it through a telescope without this filter so well i think this is going to be all for tonight and thank you for inviting me again Thank you. Thank you, Maxi. Uh, it's really my pleasure. It's it's great to watch the um, uh, the process of um, you know getting the, the I'm I'm kind of newbie in this you play. About, you know, you're you're processing it, removing the stars, putting them back in later. I think is a great process because sometimes um, you know with so much processing, the stars kind of take a beating. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I would I would agree with you. Uh, now, when something that you know Molly and uh, often asks about what script is being used uh, for a particular process, how easy is it? I mean, uh, I don't use PixInsight, for example. Um, is it something that you can get the script shared to you by another astrophotographer? And you just plug it in, and it just works. Yeah, depends of the version of the your pics inside you have, and also if it's a free uh, script yeah. or maybe not. For example, the Blur Exterminator doesn't, but this script is free. Uh, you put it on your resources uh, link, and then go up update, and it, it gets installed. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, also. Uh, you can work if you want to, but depends on how you work. Uh, how every astrophotographer, I think, has their own work. You can copy from what some people do or some not, but uh, you do your own style, kind of that. Sure. Trying to make uh, uh, same pictures or similar but when your signature for example exactly yeah well it's your trademark the work you're doing yeah. is so <laughs> thank you uh, thank, beautiful thank you work guys. very nice thank, thank, you. You. thank you john <laughs> all right and that's the yeah that's the voice of uh uh john Sh uh, schwartz in the background uh, uh you know an amazing astro artist and um uh john is uh uh, looks like he's got a stormy looking Milky Way behind him. And uh, so, John, it's been how a little, a little hazy here yeah. lately for some reason. Uh, hazy. The, oh. the fog, uh, you know, every morning it rolls in and actually at night, right after dark. So we've been kiboshed. But the, the views of Venus and the moon are exceptional right now. So if you get a chance, get out and look at that bright star due west. That's Venus, and it's amazing right now. People are seeing clouds with the violet filter, and, you know, it's a very good time to see stuff on there. And, of course, the moon, one of my favorites. Oh, sure, sure. Well, we'll let you get started here, John. Okay. Thank you for coming on to the 121st Global Star Party. I think I'm on my way. The only problem with the zoom, you have to highlight every one. So tell me, how's uh, the sun? It's been looking amazing too. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. And perhaps we'll have Northern Lights down in our neck of the woods. Is that possible? I have, not, I have not seen them down here in Arkansas, but we often have cloudy skies. That yeah. one night, like a month ago, uh, they were spotted as far south as Arizona. So it's possible. Yeah, that's pretty far south. I you heard... need like KP8, I think, to to have any chance of them that far south. But we're getting solar max isn't still for until 2025. So we got some, we still have some solar activity left to climb to so it could happen yeah i mean i really want to see that eclipse uh hopefully i can get to it in time that's a once in a lifetime experience 
Okay, well, I'll start with this. You know, the sun in the universe is amazing and the way the clouds reflect the light. And so when I'm out walking my dog, I always have my cell phone and I take pictures of the beautiful things that I see when I look up. <laughs> very nice picture. The sunsets are very beautiful here. Oh, yeah. I call that the cherry bomb sunset. Hmm kind of a unique uh, pairing with the tree branch connected. Of course, the moon, this is an actual painting of the moon, a sketch, a cloudy moon, because here in Southern California, it's been extremely rainy and cloudy. And we've had the atmospheric river. So it's uh, really nice to get some clearing. Again, in the clouds. You know, everything's foggy lately for some reason. My mind, I'm, I'm in a drift. <laughs> yeah. But if you look, uh, you know, this is a very symbolic painting uh, with the tree, you know, capturing you and, and holding you from seeing a clear vision of your path. And everything's just foggy, you know, there, but you just keep trucking and keep looking up and guess what? you'll find your way. Another version. Oh, these are just quick sketches. Uh, you know, I'll do these and then I can remaster them later. That's really how I do the bulk of my work is in the field, you can get only so much detail because the time it takes to do so. But if you have a general shape and, and um, kind of like a template, you just create your own template and then you fill it in later, you know, and you can add views and it's an accumulative view over time. This was uh, looking out one night towards uh, the west where there's McCoy Mountain with a cross over Simi Valley and all the lights and the people in the foreground. And then you go to the moon and the clouds and then the stars, just a beautiful view one night. That was a colored pencil sketch on paper. This is my latest work. Um, just a simple geometric, you know, shape with a little curvy something on the left. That's a actual tree. And then the moon, the color of the moon was incredible. The interplay between warm and cool colors Mm -hmm. It's uh, really hard to capture. It took took some time. You wouldn't think there's much to this, but love the moon. Oh, yeah. Here's another one. This is looking through the trees. You know, once I got out of the fog, I got into the trees. Now I got to break free. And there I am. I made it. <laughs> I'm up at, uh, that's Choo Choo Pay you know, Chuchu Pede, the mountain, the lower mountain parking lot. Oh, okay. This is now we're getting ready to do some work uh, with a 28 visual this night. Wow. That's Messier A and B. So you can imagine the resolution you're getting. And again, it was done more later than in the beginning, you know, it was basically laid out and then I worked on it from there. Wow. This is a cool view. Uh, whenever we're at Mount Pinos, it's usually in the summer because it's warmer and, you know, certain objects are up, especially the springtime galaxies. Then if you stay up all night, you really get a treat uh, through all the summer highlights and showpiece items. But we're always waiting for NGC 891, you know, it's a very elusive, uh, low surface brightness galaxy. But in the big telescope, you start to see some some detail, really cool. And we're always just sitting there waiting. There's kind of a lull in the action. Everybody's having coffee or, or maybe, you know, eating something. But this was the view looking at the mountain west where it was going to rise. And then I uh, just kind of made it a little bigger, like I see it in the 28. It's kind of, I guess you would call this space art. 
Yeah, that's really pretty. Yeah. This is just a, a anatomy of the cat's eye nebula, the inner structure. I just tried to, you know, break it down. Imagine the spherical lobes, the way the geometry is uh, from the explosion, and probably the poles went first. So I would, I think that's why you have that lighter. I'm not sure, but just an amazing sight. Could you imagine being right up to that and uh, seeing inside? Crazy. At the, the white dwarf uh, glowing, heavy. So this was my first rendition in uh, monochromatic of M2 before I added color. You know, that so is, I always I, I like would to imagine work. this takes a lot of time to make, you know? You know, I got to tell you, I couldn't hitchhike for two weeks because my thumb froze up. It was uh, from all the buttons pushing. It was terrible. <laughs> And, and my index finger, I couldn't point at anybody either. It was terrible. But, you know, I kept going because you always got to keep going. You never let it defeat you. It takes a long time. It's luminous. It's, it, um, yeah, I, I love these. You know, you paint with, it is. you use a, a gradation of star dots, which is different magnitude. They're, it's not correct. I mean... Uh, there is a basic layout that uh, that is correct, you know, off of a grid pattern where I laid it out a long time ago. Um, just like the old guys used to do, you know, Sir Lord Ross, they would use these gr grids. I mean, their work was way better than mine because I have technology. So mm -hmm. uh, just being able to do this digitally and, and the advantages for me is every piece of art I can work on forever so when it's raining out or everyone asks me john aren't you stir crazy i go well you know i am but i have you know cloudy nights sketching forums there's some amazing work on there some of the best um they're out doing it and uh it's fun to participate this is m13 from a long time ago through i believe it was my 14 inch dob stuff hmm. you know uh it takes a lot to get the image scale here's venus and jupiter again that conjunction this was another night right i i like the way jupiter was diffusing like illuminating the clouds like it was in the clouds but you know it's way farther than that This was a daytime Venus. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried. You know, Abraham Lincoln actually spotted Venus in the daytime just with his eye. He just looked in the right place yeah. and you can see it. Amazing. So I used to do this a lot when I when it was, you know, favorable condition. But this was a tough one because it was like approaching noon, high noon, actually. And uh, so that was due south. And it was just a sliver of a crescent, hmm. just like our moon, you know, it goes through phases. So going around the sun, so you can imagine how the shadow changes every day. Those are clouds. I just painted those, but I mean, it was very similar to what I was seeing in the sky. This was uh, Mount Pinos. You know, there's these trees when you go up there and uh, when you go in the daytime, it's really hot because you're 9,000 feet and it's, you know, Southern California, quite warm. So you go sitting, you know, near the forest or something where there's shade under a tree. These are four trees, you know, you've seen pictures like that, but this is a real place. So kind of captured by imagination. Well, I always like to close with some beautiful flowers and you know, recognizing the beauty all around us that this universe gave us. And, you know, you just have to look outside and look up in the sky. You see so many beautiful things. You don't want to miss out on them. So I capture them so I can share them. Kind of brighten someone's day. I know they brighten mine. Yeah, absolutely. These are like star clusters. You know, I'm going to be doing some of these too, where, where these flowers are, adrift in you know just their little sphere of life and 
And then what I'll do is I'll add stars to it and take the leaves out and make it a cluster. Another, just walking my dog, you know, I see incredible, beautiful things that, you know, the universe has provided God, you know, everything. It's truly amazing to see right now uh, with all the rain, how everything is growing and towards the sun. These flowers, look at these, the different colors. Oh, yeah. Just kind of almost like a, not a Maxwell Parish, but Andrew Wyatt, maybe. Yeah. This was a rubber tree, always captivated me, the, the colors on it. It was just the strangest thing, and it was so perfect. And then this gardener chainsawed it. I was, like, upset because it's not mine, but my dog and I, we love that tree. It's still there, but it doesn't look this good. Well, I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. You know, if you can get out, get some equipment and get out and uh, look at the sky because there's so many amazing things right now that you can see, like Venus. If you want to see clouds on another planet, that like Mars, I mean, Venus, that's pretty incredible. So great. get on out. Star hey, party. Get out there and look at uh, the supernova and M101. Uh, that's going to be something else you can find pretty easily. So, as Molly pointed out earlier. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you, Scott. My tonight. pleasure. Thank you, John. Uh, Have a wonderful uh, evening. Yep. Take care. Um, our next speaker is Marcello Souza in Brazil. And uh, Marcello, um, thanks for coming on to our 121st Global Star Party. Uh, what is happening in astronomy in Brazil? Uh, this, this <laughs> Thank week. you very much for the invitation, Scott. Uh, here, we are doing a lot of things here, not only our group, but we have many groups working here. I will share some uh, activities that we developed. And also, we have now uh, some changes in one of the stars that I would like to, to show. Here is our, our group. Let me see if we, we work now. My computer is very slow sometimes. And I noted now that you, your time is zone changed in huh? the United States. Huh? Because now it's only two hours from, <laughs> from okay. us. Marcello, uh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I was calculating UTC incorrectly on the schedule. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that. I was like... Maybe so I, I should, should have been corrected before, <laughs> and uh, Maxi pointed it out to me today, and I go, he says, that's the reason why Marcello and I were late. <laughs> <laughs> ah, because it is early for me here. Yeah. <laughs> today no, is early. It's good. Yeah, but it. you didn't change. Your time zone didn't change. Mm. Because I think that your time zone, it's now... We, the, we are in this, central daylight time right now, so that... But, it, 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 but in summer, you change, you no. Know? Yes, we do. You have daylight. We have daylight. Okay. Yeah. In Brazil, you know, it's easier. We have... thought about it the wrong way and stayed up too late doing yeah. the schedule. So. Okay. After the presentation of a uh, uh, John and before that, that's fantastic. Is is uh, I would like to remember and the quotes from Einstein. That's something that motivated our group here. Uh, to use creativity and your imagination to develop our project. That's something that is very important to, to know that the only knowledge, sometimes it's not the, the solution for the problems. No? The imagination is very important to creativity. And here is the activity. I will show image of two activities that we develop. These are, we have now a portable, a mobile, exhibition that we are going to many places. This is the activity in a, the Reserva Caruaro, that is a protected forest. Here is the headquarters. Yeah? And uh, they received the uh, schools 
and we are developing astronomy activities in this place for the students, teachers, and for the public, general public. Here was one of the presentations there. That this happened last Friday. That we had the opportunity to try to see the, the sun, but we had clouds, and we made a presentation about it, the moon for the kids. And we are going to make two days of activities in this place that's located almost 35 kilometers far from our city here. Is in front of the ocean, and it is a protected forest. They are they are now requesting the recognition from the International Dark Sky Association as a dark sky place because you don't have lights at night. There, here is the other part of our exhibition about the constellations. Then there are two members of our astronomy group, Kezia and the Robson. And we were there with our uh, telescope, solar telescope, but the, the weather didn't help us and it wasn't possible. Today it's cloudy here. Uh, and the prediction is that uh, during all the week we have clouds here. And this is a, a fantastic history. This, this is the first public observatory in our city. I found this, this observatory because I have I have a friend that worked there uh, with a, a, patolo a pathology that you say in English I don't know in Portuguese it's pathology it's a technical uh, course associated with medicine yeah. with doctors and uh, in this the place that he worked in the last floor of the school they had a telescope there, a refractor telescope there. And the, he in the, a hole in the, how to say, in, I forgot the name for the part, in the roof, né? a hole in the roof. And then uh, the, they try to uh, knew about the history of the observatory. And in the, the 60s, in the 60s, they built this observatory in this school as part of a science laboratory. And in the 70s, they closed the observatory. Then the observatory was closed for more than 40, more than 40 years. And they had the telescope there. Now the telescope, nobody knows where it is, but uh, they now rebuilt the, the observatory. And this is the hole right, that they use to make the observation. And uh, they bought a, a telescope to use there. And uh, we will be responsible to help them to develop activities of astronomy in this school. It's a private school. Uh, of a uh, high school and fundamental school that have students from both. That this is the hole in the roof, and uh, this we are trying to begin activities there. One of the members of our astronomy club is hiding as a professor, a teacher there, to develop activities with the students there. And uh, this that is in my hand here is the only part of the old telescope that they found. That is the, they used to, to find you know, the finder of the telescope. Mm -hmm. And the, not, from with this finder, we can know the size of diameter of the refractor telescope that was there. And it was- uh, Oh, because of the, uh, because of the radius of the- Yes. You yes, yeah. okay. have the curve here that you are yeah. fixed yeah. at the telescope. Then we know the size of the telescope. And this is an audio orrery that they use also in the observatory. These are the only parts that uh, we found, right? and also the, the group that is there found. We, they didn't find any pictures 
of the old observatory. Oh. We know only we know only about these two uh, equipments and the, about reports that we received. I talk about with the director of the school that bought the telescopes, the telescope, and he, he uh, the history is very short for him because he, he asked to buy scientific equipments and then they bought also a telescope and they, they made a hole, but uh, he didn't remember who was in charge with the telescope there. And we are trying to find who that made observations there using the telescope. Uh, beginning in the 60s, then uh, 60 years ago uh, that they developed activities there. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, something that I'm trying to, to, to follow, that is what's happening with Betelgeuse. Uh, but before I talk about Betelgeuse, I will show what you, the presentation that we make for the students about the size of the stars, comparing with the Earth and the planets. Here is the sun with the, our planet, and we show how the new, the stars that have name that is easy to find in the sky, the size, comparing the size with our sun. Here, the sun is only a dot. And here, we have the two big ones, the two, two supergiants, Betelgeuse and Antares. And now, Betelgeuse, uh, is doing something different from the normal. Right? Generally, Betelgeuse, that uh, I know that everybody knows where it is. Right? This is a, a picture from, it, it was made by the Hubble Space Telescope. Right? This, is, this is the image of the Betelgeuse. And here we can compare the size of the star with the size of the Jupiter's orbit. Uh, the size of the Jupiter orbits here. It is bigger than the size of the Jupiter. That's that's something that our the people who are watching who do astronomy outreach, when you show Betelgeuse, uh, yeah. Betelgeuse uh, you should um, talk about the size of Jupiter's orbit, you know, as being the uh, diameter of this massive star. Yeah, it's, it's bigger than. Well, it's big, bigger right? than that. <laughs> yes. You see here, in the comparing here, it's bigger than the size of the Jupiter's orbit. You know? It's a supergiant, red supergiant star. And now, uh, it, it is, it was, no? the 10th uh, brightness star in the sky. No? But now, it is the seventh. Uh, something is changing. Now the brightness is bigger than Ar Arcana and the Procyon. Then it's seven. Wow. It's like a now. bunch of gems. Yeah, something is happening. It, this is... Uh, here you see how it's changing the brightness with the years. Here we have the dimming here in 29, 2019, 2020. That you saw this one. That's a dimming here. And now it is with 140% higher the brightness than was expecting. Then this is the graph. Right? This, these are images from A. Avisor. Right? That uh, you see here the brightness, the flux, right? that you can associate with the brightness. Here you see that now it's it growing. Right? I think that. Uh, in, in, we have a period that it, it will be difficult for us to, to see here at night, the, the winter for us, but uh, in the, before the sun, the sun set, I think that it will be possible to see here in the morning, before the, we have the sun in the sky, we can see, in, and we will try to, to take pictures and follow what's happening here. Uh, because it's something different that uh, I don't know if you have uh, you see a supernova there, uh, but if this happens, we have maybe problems here in Earth because you have a lot of uh, gamma array arriving here. Uh, mm. Maybe this will bring problems for us. 
and you will see a bright dots in the sky with the same brightness of the moon, the full moon, but it will be a small né? star with a big brightness. Maybe we will see something like the Chinese saw in 15.4, né? that was the Crab Nebula, né? that was they saw in daytime. Né? This, I don't know if you, it will happen, but uh, we need to be careful. Né? That's something that's possible to happen. Né? I, I don't know who am, nobody, I think that nobody knows, but something is different with the brightness, with the, the Betelgeuse, né? then we need to, to follow this, to know if you have some surprise soon. Né? I hope that this didn't happen. Yeah, me so, too. So fast. <laughs> Not a lot we can and, do about it, so. Yes, we yeah. only can there's see. No, there's no dark mission for a supernova, so. Yeah. Yes. But now you have a supernova, né? That is in the Peewee Galaxy, né? uh, M101. And uh, I don't know anyone here has pictures of the supernova. I didn't, I yeah, didn't see. Uh, I, Marcello, I saw, um, uh, I saw this. Oh, sorry. Yes, Molly Wakeling showed images of this. Um, oh, great, great! I didn't participate early. I didn't see. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And this is an image from uh, the spaceweather.com. They have this picture of the, the supernova. I'll try to. For us, it's very difficult to see here because it's in Russia major and I can't see from my seat. It's near the horizon and you, we can see only parts of the constellation. And for, for, from, for us here, it's difficult to see. But it's something that is a moment to use the telescopes to observe. It is easy to see in telescopes in the United States. A small telescope. I saw this information that, that is possible to see in a four inch telescope. I don't know if it's correct, this information. It is so easy to see. I don't know. I don't know if you, you already did you see it, Scott? So it's, um, as of last oh, night, right. it was about magnitude 11, which is 11. Uh, definitely within range of small telescopes. Um, ah, great. Yeah, so a, a good target for anyone to go to go check out. Ah, great. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it's not possible for us, but uh, I, I will follow, uh, I will try to see the image that you are taking from. Oh, thank you, Scott, thank you. Okay. This is what, and I think that soon we'll have a new edition of Skies Up, no? I hope so. Yeah, yeah, very soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the invitation. Ever is a great right. pleasure to be here. So um, uh, we have a few of our speakers are still with us um, listening in. I want to thank the audience for watching from around the world. And, uh, um, you know, we have completed the 121st Global Star Party. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I think we, um, we're still on schedule for the 122nd Global Star Party, so, um, uh, but uh, you guys uh, keep looking up, that's something my old friend Jack Horkheimer always used to say, and uh, um, until uh, next week, uh, you know, hope you have clear skies. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.
So it's a beautiful sunny day and uh, we have uh, uh, you know our refractor out and I've got my eclipse glasses on and I've got my safe solar filter. Of course the eclipse is not here yet but um, I wanted to take a few minutes just to show you some things about uh, solar filter safety. Uh, the filters that we use is the uh, Thousand Oaks material. It is uh, rated to the highest uh, ISO standards um, and uh, ind actually independently tested by us as well. So just to make sure that those standards are met. So if you're going to use a telescope to look at the partial phases, and par the, let me underline partial phases to you. You use eclipse glasses to observe the sun in partial phases when it's uh, in total, if you're going to be on the path of totality, you can take the glasses off and only during that time, which is going to be roughly two minutes this time on August 21st, only during that time can you directly look up at where the sun is because it's completely blocked out. You'll see the corona, you'll see you know, lots of really cool effects that will they'll leave you speechless. But during all the partial phases, you have to have safe solar filtration. So how do you do it uh, properly? Uh, let me show you. First off, let's show you what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do is put on eclipse glasses and look through the telescope that's unfiltered. Uh, and I'll show you exactly why here. We're going to point the telescope directly at the sun. And right now, we have sunlight coming right through the eyepiece. Um, you know, if you turn that up a little bit. If you use solar glasses, and look right at the filter material, you see it's already burning. It's burning a hole right through the solar filter material. That is how powerful a telescope is. So this is definitely something you don't want to do. You can now see that there is a hole through there, and that could be your eye. So this is what can happen if you think that you can use eclipse glasses to look through unfiltered telescopes or binoculars. If you do that, uh, the sun's energy is going to burn right through the filter and burn right into your eye. So if you're going to use a telescope or a pair of binoculars to watch the partial phases of a total eclipse or just to observe the sun to look for sunspots or something like that, uh, make sure that you are using an over-the-lens solar filter that has the uh, proper ISO safety rating and all of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this filter on. It's, uh, you can see how snugly it's fitting here. This is not about to come off, uh, uh, but uh, you know, if you have a loose fitting filter, use tape. Do anything that you can to make sure that the filter is not going to come off. Um, and then the, the other thing is too, is that uh, finder scopes, um, uh, optical finder scopes are like little telescopes and they need to be filtered as well. In this case, I just have a red dot finder. There is no um, magnifying power to it, so I'm not gonna use it to sight the sun in. The way I'm gonna sight in the sun is literally as I'm, I'm gonna look down at the shadow and align the scope up, so I'm getting the smallest shadow possible of the telescope as it's hitting the ground. And now I can safely look at the sun in comfort look at sunspots and if we have partial phases going on in the eclipse I'll see them all.